The folks were at um, 84, including me. Um, there's 95 in the course. Uh, I guess there's just a few laggards. We'll um, uh, kick off. Uh, before I forget, let's uh, straight away do the attendance thing. We're in week five. So if you could just hit five and hit return. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now I'm, I'm uh, conscious, although I don't like to do it, uh, this week is a very ipoteki, uh, very <laughs> one way from me, uh, just simply because there's so much material that I want to uh, cover, unfortunately. Um, but uh, immediately after I've done the uh, lots of talking, uh, then uh, we can do a Q&A as I flagged in my message to you. So we'll do that online. We can do that through till about uh, three o'clock. Um, a reminder that you've got your uh, selfie video task due on May 31st. So that's something you really want to be focused on. Hopefully you've been taking um, fulsome use of, uh, making fulsome use of those links uh, on the course website, um, designingcc.wordpress.com. Um, um, co. And of course, once you get to there, you'll discover that there are so many other links, you know, about um, video production and whatnot. And I, uh, I've had quite a few messages from people. I, I'm a little bit slow on a couple of them. I remember one person asked me about um, uh, editing software that um, I think I, uh, one I didn't reply to, and my apologies, I, I, I can't remember who the person was, I'm sorry. Um, if you have an Apple uh, device, a Mac, then iMovie is uh, a really decent thing to use. Um, uh, please note that iMovie, the iOS version is very limited. Um, if you're making a bit of a primitive TikTok video or something like that, uh, maybe it's okay. It's very much designed for being able to throw something up on the go. With social media from your um, iPad or your iPhone. Um, on uh, your computer itself, it's actually a much more powerful bit of software. Um, Final Cut Pro is the uh, the really high-end video editing software in the Apple, uh, which is um, quite expensive and wouldn't expect anyone to go buying it <laughs> for this project. Um, mind you, you can get a, um, an academic bundle um, with uh, Logic and uh, the, the really high-end software for uh, sound editing. So, but that still adds up to Nimon Yonsen. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated process for doing it. You actually have to buy, buy it through the Apple store, um, but then they send you an email and it's, it's a bit of a rigmarole. Um, iMovie is more than enough for what you want to do. And indeed for music as well, even Gar GarageBand. Uh, those of you already into music making will, will know that that's not bad. Um, one I suggest if you have an iPad, because um, iMovie on the iPad isn't real good, uh, there's a, a cheap, but very good software called, um, as I've, I've mentioned it on the website already, um, Luma Fusion. And uh, then in terms of editing, but also filming, particularly if you want to use your phone, um, uh, Filmic Pro is at not a pro price is a good thing to do. And there's a whole bunch of other things out there. I'm afraid I'm not really up on cheap applications for um, uh, Windows-based software, but there's quite a few out there um, that you can find for not very much, okay? Um, the Apple Store has a huge array of them as well if you're, a, if you're an Apple user, but um, I recommend just starting I, uh, with iMovie um, particularly on a, on a laptop or a, uh, um, iMac or something, then that will be um, more than enough for your purposes. And the iPad LumaFusion is a good option. Um, I don't think there's a LumaFusion version for um, uh, non-iOS, uh, non-Apple tablets, unfortunately. Okay. Um, just as a reminder of the materials that uh, you've got at hand for our hugely important topic today of uh, design thinking, I'll just do a very quick screen share. Um, so just to remind you what's on the website.
so uh, this is under um, example C, so topics 9 to 13 and those topics in brackets, remember, um, on the, uh, the, the list of topics that are organised by week. Um, so we're the, uh, we have the schedule by week, but then uh, and with the topics that we're covering each week and then in brackets is a little magical number and that number relates to the order of topics on the website. Um, the reason why the numbers don't neatly align with the uh, week topics, of course, is that um, I've um, changed around some of the order of what we're doing in, in the course. Um, this has happened over the last two semesters. Last year, the, um, uh, the whole semester was cut short by three weeks. So that was one of the complications. Um, this time round, uh, in the second half of the course, we'll be collaborating um, with some folks um, over at uh, Sophia that they have smaller numbers than we do, so we're gonna swamp them. Um, but uh, we'll be uh, collaborating carefully there with Dr. Um, Adam Johns, Professor Johns, um, who's the uh, head of the uh, Ke Gaka um, over in um, Ke Zagakabu in uh, Sofia. Okay, so design thinking, uh, I'll say more about that in a moment, but the uh, the critical thing to note here is you've got a bunch of interesting links, okay? Um, and particularly our, our concern is with the D School at Stanford and a very impress impressive company called IDEO, okay? Um, now, David Kelly um, and his brother, Tom Kelly were key founders of IDEO, but also there's some very prominent other individuals involved there. Um, so if you, if we go to here, for example, and we open the link, um, it should uh, land us across at IDEO. Okay, taking a bit to load, okay. Um, and this faults, of course, to, uh, you've got a global website um, and you can go into IDEO uh, uh, Tokyo and you can get the Japanese version. Um, and um, interestingly, in IDEO um, Tokyo, it speaks to the enormous influence of design thinking in IDEO that um, Haku Hodo have uh, taken a uh, controlling, um, well, majority stake in IDEO uh, Japan. And we're seeing more and more of uh, companies coming from either the consulting field or the advertising field moving more towards design thinking. So there's very much meeting around there. Um, and there's a, bun a bunch of reasons for that, um, which I'll, I'll come back to. So let me stop this share here uh, for the moment. Um, and let me play with the, uh, the views. Right, okay. And I will Go back to, in, in just a moment to the um, site. Do another share again. Just bear with me a moment. Just a reminder of a couple of things that's on the, on the site here. A little bit easy to miss unless you read the, the text carefully. Um, there are two very good TED lectures um, from David Kelly um, on particularly human-centric design and the nature of, well, one's on human-centric design and one's on creative confidence, building creative confidence. And uh, the one on creative confidence uh, mirrors the content of uh, the book he wrote with his brother, Tom, um, hugely influential book called Creative Confidence, Unleading the, Unleashing the Creative Potential Within Us All. Um, it's a good read. Uh, in fact, um, let me be theatrical. Here's the book, pulling it off my shelf. And um, is it signed by Tom Kelly? Okay. Um, Christopher, best wishes to you and all the creative people at Waseda. Yay. Okay. Um, and I actually, for this copy, um, I have a former Zimise of mine uh, to thank because she actually managed to get herself an incredibly prized um, internship at IDEO and was there for months. And she used to routinely chat with Tom Kelly and he sent his best regards with a signed copy of the, uh, the book because um, we're actually using it as a uh, textbook in the Zimi as well. 
um, in our in our third semester. So my whole zim is on creative industries and uh, sense and sensibility in the second semester, and then um, creative by design in the third semester. And we do some stuff with with design thinking and applying it. Um, what's particularly interesting is with uh, design thinking, it's the culmination of a process of advocacy that people like David Kelly and others have done for quite a few years to argue that design is not something that just highly trained designers do, that you don't have to go to a design school to benefit from design theory and a design approach to the world. And IDEO is this premium, hugely influential consultancy that do everything from product design to policy design, interface design, um, a bunch of uh, designed interventions in terms of social problems and whatnot. Uh, they have been real champions of a design methodology toolkit that anybody can download and use. And they have some tailored toolkits. For example, they have a, a toolkit for applying design thinking to schools. And this is a, a very interesting trend in the United States, particularly because there's such a huge variety in the quality of school experiences in the US, um, many under public, underfunded public schools, unfortunately, um, but many schools themselves are trying to take the initiative to um, better improve the, uh, the student and the learning experience. And so IDEO and the D school at Stanford have been trying to support those kind of processes. So they have a toolkit very specifically for schools. One of my Zimmy says, graduated now and gone to a big consulting firm, uh, Haruna. Um, she wrote a superb thesis very specifically about whether design thinking could be applied to Japanese schools. And the first thing she did was actually to do a full Japanese translation of IDEO's toolkit for schools. So what we're seeing with design thinking is it's saying that there's something in the worldview and the approach, the ways of working of designers that anyone can benefit from and uh, anyone can learn and deploy um, if you take those key concepts and distill them um, into a meaningful and accessible kind of way. And so you can see several downloads here um, very specifically. To get a little bit of background on um, David Kelly and to see just what an incredibly nice, caring, earthy kind of guy he is, have a look at this YouTube video if you haven't already uh, seen it. And I thought it'd be meaningful to link it, uh, design thinking and um, particularly more broadly how designers see the world to entrepreneurship as well. Um, good example here of um, Airbnb, one of the co-founders of Airbnb. Their uh, DNA is so much tied to uh, design because the initial idea for Airbnb came about um, because of a design conference in San Francisco. Uh, a bunch of young designers and still design students were involved in this big design conference that was going to be held. And they realized that a lot of the young designers who would come to it uh, couldn't afford accommodation in San Francisco, hugely expensive. And uh, so they started an initiative to effectively allow people coming to the conference to camp on other people's floor. Um, so they bought some, you know, air mattresses and whatnot. And, and then they got to thinking about, well, we're designers, you know, how can we make this a positive experience for people who are going to be doing, you know, the equivalent of kind of couch surfing for this design conference. And so they did a whole bunch of, bunch of fun things, navigating the city and uh, whatnot. Um, but their perspective was very much as designers. And then they got to thinking that this could actually work as a business. And that is the, uh, the basis of Airbnb. Um, and you get a sense of where the air came from because people were sleeping on air mattresses. That was the idea that it was, it was like a, a, bread and a bed and breakfast, B&B. Uh, um, and Airbnb because they were literally on air mattresses on the floor, okay? Um, towards the end of the presentation today, I'm going to make links between design thinking as we understand it as a field and approaches that have been used in the advertising industry over decades. There are some similarities, there are some differences. Um, 
And as a way to start that conversation, I've got here a uh, classic interview um, with David Ogilvy, the founder of Ogilvy and Mather, um, one of the most influential firms uh, in the post-war development of advertising. They have a um, significant office in Tokyo. It's not absolutely huge. Um, they, uh, all the foreign agencies struggle in Japan to um, compete with the scale of Densu and Hakuhodo, particularly Densu. Um, the reason for that is although they have very distinctive capabilities, um, many respects much more capable than what Densu and Hakuhodo do, um, the actual media buying function you know, if you if you create advertising, you you have to put it out there through communications channels. Um, Denso has enormous influence, in particular, on the media buying function, and part of their business model is to make a lot of money off that and um, throw the creative in as a bit of a kind of a omake uh, to some clients. And so, when you come as a foreign agency to Japan, you really have to bring a very distinctive value proposition. Because in the end, so many of your clients are going to have to go to Denso anyway and pay their um, very significant prices. Um, so um, they haven't grown, Ogilvy and Meath haven't grown to the scale you might expect in Japan, mirroring their strengths in other markets. Um, but they are a very distinctive outfit nonetheless. And actually, uh, several former um, SIL students I know some in Maizemi and a couple others who weren't, um, they've gone to uh, work for them. So anyway, I'll stop this screen share. I really actively encourage you to look at the resources here for design thinking, um, not just because it's key to our course, um, but also because I think you will find it very useful in terms of your own career and certainly in terms of your job hunting. Uh, that uh, whether you're applying to go to a consulting firm or a manufacturer or whatever, so many companies now are focusing on uh, design thinking as a methodology. And uh, I'll come back to why that is the case uh, a little bit later. Okay, now I will run this again, I think off the PDF, although by doing it with a PDF, it kind of messes with having my little floating head in the side. Um, and so then the uh, the final video, um, which I'll edit up and, and then post on the website, I've done in the past, um, I'm pretty much obscure, but you don't need to see me anyway. Um, it does mean though that the recording um, ends up very much just like a talking set of slides, which is not very um, engaging. But then again, who wants to look at my head anyway? So, okay. My voice is a little bit dodgy. I've just had the uh, um, a meeting for the last hour and three quarters <laughs> um, just before kicking off here talking about um, SILS curriculum and, and uh, what we're going to be doing um, in the lieu of study abroad and a whole bunch of uh, interesting things um, that are going to very much impact on yourselves. Um, there's a, uh, a lot to debate. So I'll be swigging water as I go, bear, bear with me. Okay, so design thinking is our topic. And let me blow this up here, have a squeak. Right. Okay, so a bit of an overview of the, uh, the topic as a whole. Um, I really want to emphasize that design thinking in some sense is problem solving, um, but it's bigger than uh, I think much more meaningful in many ways than the kind of Monday Keiketsu, the very narrow kind of sense of problem solving um, that has become a little bit faddy, remarkably belatedly in the Japanese context. I mean, if you, if you read about the SILS curriculum and what we're doing, our Kyoiko Hoshin, blah, 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 um, you'll see that we emphasize critical thinking um, and uh, problem solving. But uh, for several decades now, the move towards design thinking has been onto that, but goes beyond that because we'll find that problem discovery and problem definition is the really interesting aspect that the, uh, the problem solving implies that this is already a well-found a well and well-defined problem. 
And uh, so then that really just becomes a set of kind of technical and data issues to solve the problem, yeah, which is which is still valuable, but that actually we want to go well beyond that. And many of the most dynamic companies are so, uh, the most profitable companies, companies like Apple are so, uh, because they've gone out and found problems you didn't even know that you had. They solve your problem before you could articulate your problem. Um, you know, the, uh, the problems that uh, are really well-defined uh, are either kind of insoluble, given the existing levels of um, technological uh, constraints, for example, or because the structure of interests around them, there are, you know, pretty much eternal political conflicts that go on, for example, um, they can't readily be solved. Um, or more interestingly, there are a whole bunch of problems that people don't recognize as problems until they're identified as such when they're clearly defined and then people's energies can be uh, directed to them. So I wanna talk a bit about design thinking as even a liberal art um, and potentially as an ethos and a method, talk a little bit about design theory as well. Um, but very importantly, although we talk about design thinking, it's really more design action. Um, in fact, uh, David Kelly has said that design thinking in some sense is misnamed, that it should be a more of a design action orientation, uh, rather than a ponderous philosophical um, endeavor. So in a funny kind of way, we'll, we'll see when we talk about design thinking, we're actually talking about less about thinking and more about um, empathetic seeing and then acting in an iterative kind of way. Okay, so this leads us to discussions of, of design processes. And you know, those firms that are devoted to design across diverse fields, they have certain similarities in terms of how they understand processes of, of um, going through design, whether it's architectural design, product design, um, customer experience design, for example, and we'll talk about that. I uh, want to particularly focus on um, IDEO and Stanford D School. They are perhaps the best proponents of the, uh, the most recent um, version of design thinking as clearly expressed by the Kelly brothers and whatnot. And we'll see that what we strongly emphasize here is insight and empathy. So Sympathy and empathy, people often ask about the distinction here. Sympathy is more like um, you kind of sympathize with someone. Um, doesn't, uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to an action orientation. Empathy is more of overall being attuned to the needs, the emotional state, the um, the struggles and the triumphs, the successes, the, the, the small satisfactions that people have, okay? Um, so being alert to others, um, but it also has kind of um, ongoing continuous implications for you, how you interact with others. You know, you can, you can feel sympathy for someone, but not in, do anything about it, okay? Um, and it can be a very, you know, and, uh, you know, you can you can look with pity upon the upon the uh, the poverty stricken, for example, but not reach into your pocket and pull any change out. Okay, um, when we speak more of empathy, it's it's normally in terms of an action orientation. You're interacting with people, and it's something that you bring in a continuous kind of process um, that informs your daily interaction with people. Uh, then we'll turn our attentions to the established creative process in producing advertising copy, and I, and I want to emphasise too that actually. Um, the practice of advertising in some agencies, and I, th I think very much um, in the Japanese context, often doesn't even achieve the ideals um, long established since the 1950s and 60s, for example, in the industry in terms of insight, let alone the, uh, the standards we would expect if we brought a design thinking perspective to it. Um, Iterative design process. Iterative just means simply um, repeating in, 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 an, in an interactive kind of way. You try something, um, it doesn't quite work, you, 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 you do it again. It's, a, it's, it's repeat. It's not a one shot kind of thing. Okay. You, you kind of try it, you do a prototype, you test 
Um, and that's the critical thing you test, you go back and you revise and, and keep iterating like any good writer does. You um, multiple drafts, multiple edits, for example, um, in a similar kind of way with the entire design process. And I'm a bit more theorizing at the end. Okay. Oh, and right at the end, I'll, I'll talk about some personal attributes that help you succeed um, in terms of bringing design thinking to the world at large. Okay, now the first thing I wanna emphasize is that um, it's a real trap to think of design as just cool, okay? You know, design is one of those sexy words um, that if we hear designer, um, it tends to be associated with, of course, being expensive and stylish and whatnot. Some people use it in a parody kind of way. You know, we talk about designer glasses, designer clothes, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, you'll see this on real estate sites. Um, designer mansion, tokane. Designer mansion normally means solid concrete walls, um, stainless steel, kitchen bench, um, and no kind of cupboards, nowhere to store anything. Um, a, a certain uh, minimalist kind of aesthetic. Um, by the way, friends of mine with young kids who tried living in those kind of places say that solid concrete walls with children are just truly awful. As soon as a child runs into it, bang, you're off to the hospital at three o'clock in the morning or something, okay? Um, so we mustn't succumb to the trivial and misleading take on design thinking that it's just all about appearances. Um, because we'll see that the criteria really for effective design are more around things like effective resolution, solving the problem that you've identified for users um, in a significant way. And we see sometimes that actually that means um, that you actually compromise aesthetic um, appearances. You know, the, the classic one is the electronics device, for example, or the consumer device, where you've stripped it back to make it a hyper minimalist box, for example. Um, and the way you've done that is to actually have a more complicated interface. So you've only got one button on it. And if you want um, to do one thing, you press the button once. Um, if you want to do another thing, you've got to press the button three times or you hold it down for a certain period of time or whatever. Um, and of course, if you lose the manual, uh, you have absolutely no idea how to make this thing kind of work and do what you want to do. Uh, there's a big debate about that with Apple, whether they have gone too much towards minimalism at the expense of usability. I think they pretty much strike the right balance. Um, but there is an argument that uh, a lot of the, uh, the cult of minimalism has actually diminished usability. And that is something we'll come back to when we talk about um, interface design later on in the semester, particularly what we call the affordances of things, how we actually interact uh, with a device. And we'll look at a few very influential um, writers, thinkers, designers um, on that. So my fourth point here is design thinking will not sacrifice empathetic insight into user needs um, for a positive third party appraisal of the aesthetic merits of a proposed solution. Now that's a big sentence. What am I saying is, okay, you're not gonna compromise user needs and your, your, your insight understanding of the user needs just to make something look cool, okay? Um, that it has to work better uh, efficiently. Yeah, the classic one, for example, is um, normally more buttons clearly labeled on uh, something makes it easier to use than fewer buttons. Even though it might look a little bit busy, um, you press a button that gives you the functionality uh, you want. Uh, we see this as being an ongoing issue with the design of cars and particularly the, uh, the driver interface because you should be concentrating on the road and hyper minimalism just simply leads to problems of not being able to find really basic functions um, when you need them. Okay, oops, let me go back. Many designers are criticized, of course, for making things too minimalist and, and less usable. Okay. Um, and uh, we will see that um, making things beautiful is, is indeed a valuable uh, objective. Some people think it's a little bit trivial, but if you uh, think about your own daily experience, the comfort that something nice can bring to you, you know, the, that, that feeling when you um, capture just a, uh, a glimpse of yourself reflected somewhere and you think, oh, 
hey, my shoes are looking pretty good. Or hopefully you can say, hey, I'm looking good. You know, you're feeling good about yourself. You know, there is, there is that reassurance that you can get um, from having nice things. Um, things that uh, you really don't want to give up. Things that, that uh, become part sometimes of your own identity. Uh, I think a, a good criteria for, for example, clothes that work well for you is that feeling at the end of the day that you don't actually want to take them off, that you're not in a hurry to, to get out of them. I'm sure unlike those of you doing shukatsu, you know, you get through the door and it's like, uh, off comes the, the tie, the restrictive tie and the, uh, God forbid, the alki suit and all the rest of it. You know, you can't wait to, um, to shed your skin, okay, and get into something more, uh, more comfortable. So if uh, these things we use on a daily base give you positive feedback, whether it's in their materiality, whether it's in the form of them and the appearances of them, all of those things are central as well to the value that uh, a product is giving you. There's actually quite a lot of research now on um, how well-designed architectural spaces um, improve people's sense of well-being. Um, in ways that people find very difficult to articulate, but which are significant. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about problem solving. I'm sorry, I'm gonna drink again. Okay, I'm already dried out. And I'm putting both art and design together here. Now, art and design are not the same thing. Uh, there's a big debate about how do they stand in relation to each other. Um, if we think in terms of problems, this gives us a clue as to what's in common and what's different between art and design. Um, the critical thing here, um, simply put, is um, artists work on a problem of their own or of their own concern or of their own dis discovery. You know, the artist works on a creative problem that is a problem for them. They see something in the world at large or in the in life experience or, you know, the essential nature of existence or whatever. And they choose to direct their creative energies to to speak to that um, in a meaningful way through their artistic endeavor. Designers, on the other hand, work on somebody else's problem. Now, they may discover a problem through their own personal experience. It may be their own daily journey and they suddenly realize that, you know, something's missing in their life. Um, there's a pop song like that. Um, and the answer is maybe it's you, maybe it's you and me in the pop song. Uh, generally, uh, what's missing in your life are good design interventions to solve a whole lot of those problems. So designers often look to their own frustrations, um, but only because they simply uh, have so much in common with other people. You know, so we uh, see a uh, prominent Japanese designer does a lot of stuff for Muji, for example, did a very nice thing um, with a uh, umbrella uh, design where he just simply cut a little V into the top of the handle so that you can hang your uh, shopping bag off it because he uh, had experienced himself. So often he was standing there waiting for a train or something uh, with an umbrella and he wanted to hang his shopping on it and it would slip off the cheap umbrella. So just simply putting a little, a little notch in it um, allowed you to solve those problems. Um, similarly, the, uh, the Muji uh, coat hangers that have little dints in them um, to reduce the likelihood that your t-shirt's going to slide off and drop in the mud and have to be washed again, for example. So a lot of these things you can, dis these little problems you can discover um, in your own daily passage through life, okay? Um, this is one thing I do with my Zemise, actually. I get them to keep a... Um, uh, a diary of daily frustrations and uh, potential design interventions to overcome those daily, frust daily frustrations, okay? So if we think of problem solving, we can see, yeah, clearly that's what designers do. It's actually often more surprising to think of artists as working on a, on a creative problem, but equally we, we, uh, we can think in those terms. You know, the artist might, might, can, might be concerned about the status of the individual in a mass society, for example, and so many artists, you know, have been, okay? Now, the problem specification itself, the actual identification of what the problem is, the finding of the problem, the defining of the problem, the more drawing certain boundaries around the problem so it can be acted on, becomes a critical part of what designers do. So we can think of the artist's journey as to some degree seeking a problem to work on. 
Now, this could be a conceptual challenge. It could be something personal significance. It could be something of social significance. Um, and it's kind of separate but related to the question. And sorry, I've got Q here. I'm playing with this. So it's both the question and the quality of the medium. You could be a very talented artist technically. You could be a real master in oils or sketching or sculpture or whatever, but your work is not very interesting. Um, just simply because it doesn't uh, engage an audience um, on terms of things that they can relate to, things that feel of concern to them. Um, those of you who've had the uh, privilege of traveling in Europe, for example, and going to European museums would know that the, uh, when, when, you, when you go through major art museums in Europe, invariably earlier artworks in the Western tradition have overwhelmingly religious themes, um, in fact, well-established themes that everyone did, you know, so everyone would, would uh, uh, at some point in their career, they would challenge themselves to paint, um, for example, you know, the Christ crucified, um, St. Sebastian being shot full of arrows, for example. Um, so a whole bunch of established what, tropes or themes. Now for those not of um, Christian faith and particularly in the, uh, the Catholic, the high Catholic tradition, uh, a lot of that work is just not particularly engaging. You can look at it and say, well, the technical mastery is great, but um, yeah, okay. It doesn't really speak to you just simply because the subject matter is, is so remote. Art historians that may be a, a very deeply schooled in the complex layers of meaning in those artworks may be able to relate to it. But for example, one of the, uh, the great struggles, I think for a lot of people, um, trying to really engage with uh, Renaissance art is um, so many of the uh, particularly Greek um, legends, myths and legends became themes in art. And unless you're actually schooled in those myths and legends, simply decoding, understanding what, what the, uh, the works are about um, is extraordinarily difficult. Now, of course, for people in the late 19th century who were well educated and into the early 20th century, they were so, so embedded in Greek or Roman learning and whatnot that all of that um, was well understood. They had, they, uh, they had a common currency there. But these were established problems that any artist would, would work on. You know, the, uh, the modern uh, artist is at much greater liberty to work on, on problems of their own concern. So of course, many contemporary artists now are very much concerned about identity issues for historically persecuted minorities, whether it's sexual or racial identity, for example. And um, more and more audiences and curators expect artists to be engaging on you know, serious problems. Uh, it also does mean in the art world that uh, you can be a great talent, but at the time when you're doing it, um, people think, well, this this is just not interesting. Um, but that can be a function of trends um, as much in terms of the medium, for example. Uh, we see someone like Lucian Freud, uh, extraordinarily talented artist, grandson of Sigmund Freud, by the way, um, that he was a refugee from Nazi Germany to Britain as a boy. Uh, he worked in portraiture and for decades could scarcely sell pictures. Uh, later on, his works were recognized as offering a really deep, unique insight into the individual condition, partly because he very deliberately focused very meticulously on the human form and not the beautiful um, forms you would expect if someone was influenced by, say, you know, Greek statues or something like that. But he was really interested in people who were conventionally thought to be not attractive. And uh, his works became so widely recognized later in life as to have so much value that the uh, higher, highest price ever paid for a living artist was recorded by, by Lucian Freud. It was a guy who couldn't sell any pictures, you know, 20 years earlier. Um, we tend to say um, in the art world, um, as very often we do in, in the worlds of say philosophy and, and, and so many other areas in academe, that what they're doing is like not wrong, it's just not particularly interesting. And 
this implies that for the artist or the philosopher or the writer, um, you have a very strong self-belief in the meaning of what you're doing, even if it's not currently recognized. And it may take a long time before those problems, the significance of what you're working on and the quality of the means you use to explore that problem come to be recognized. This is different from the designer because the designer is doing this for work. The designer um, has to get paid unless you're in a privileged position of being independently wealthy or making the money from the client and having made enough money working as a designer that you can do freebies for other people, you know, that you can direct your energies to, so, to solving social problems, for example, um, on your own time. Um, that's a privilege for designers, but not many designers get to such a strong financial position uh, that they're able to uh, do that, okay? So what makes for worthwhile problems? This, this um, is an endless debate, of course, amongst um, art critics, you know, professional critics. Um, so it's really the, it comes down to a question whether the, uh, the problem the artist or the designer has defined is one that is interesting and valuable. Um, and it often turns on the originality of the problem that's being worked on. Um, it also means that imitation uh, will do you very poorly uh, reputation wise, that uh, if something is highly derivative, if it's very arigachi uh, in a Japanese sense, as you kind of expect, um, it's not going to win you plaudits. Um, so when we think about you know, who makes the avant garde, it's normally because they're either extraordinarily innovative in terms of the means and materials they bring to bear on a particular problem. It can be, for example, in, in terms of product design, um, bringing previously unavailable um, materials, newly developed materials, for example, to solve um, a long-standing um, existing problem, which can lead to a, to a, to a hit product, for example. Um, or in the art world, it may just, it just will be, as we see, for example, someone like Bill Viola, who uh, um, is a uh, much celebrated videographer. He brought the then new um, form of, vid of video uh, to a bunch of established uh, artistic uh, problems. So, of course, then the quality of technique and whatnot matters. I think um, what we can say is that over time, at least in the art world, technique is generally valued less than it used to be in the past, and the quality of the artistic problem uh, attracts greater weight. Okay. Um, now, a lot of Oh, there's a lot of play involved in design. Um, and so we have to think of what designers do as at the one, on the one hand, solving very particular problems, but at the same time, kind of playfully exploring the limits of the field in terms of creativity, sometimes playing with symbols, playing with materials and whatnot. Um, leading architectural firms um, often give particularly their younger designers some free time uh, to do completely experimental stuff, which is not driven by a client, for example. So Rem Kuhas, for example, Office of Metropolitan Architecture, OMA, um, has long institutionalized this kind of practice of, of um, people doing very experimental stuff to really explore the boundaries of what is possible. In something like architecture, there is uh, absolute revolution ongoing revolution underway, you know, with new materialities, uh, for example, which means that when a client does come to them, uh, they have pushed the boundaries of the possible, the envelope, we'd say pushed out the envelope as a technical, technical term, and um, um, ready to deploy kind of new approaches. Now, of course, some people will look at me, this is, this is um, an image I kind of like back from way back in 2012, Tokyo Fashion Week and one designer there. Um, I don't think um, he ever thought anyone was going to uh, buy that outfit. Uh, it's rather impractical on Tokyo subway for a start, okay? Uh, but clearly is borrowing eclectically from a whole range of uh, what, stores of existing symbols. You know, we can make sense of this in a semiotic kind of sense. Um, and to some degree, it's just about getting buzz, um, just as part of a, a, a larger portfolio of works. You know, of course, you'd never heard of the designer probably until I actually uh, kind of put him up there. So when we talk about problems, we can see that there are different kinds of problems or different kind of almost like 
thresholds or levels of problems. So we can talk about the problematic of problems, okay, or the problem of problems, okay. Uh, and this is in the design literature, design thinking literature now well established to draw a distinction between well-defined problems. This is where the goals are well specified. The challenge is to seek the means to achieve the goals within the evident constraints, okay. Um, uh, overwhelmingly, our educational paths and you know, Juken, cram schools and all the rest of it and entrance exams uh, work on an even smaller subset of well-defined problems. We work on problems where the answer is already known, okay? So a, there was an established problem, an established way of expressing that problem and an established answer. And so fundamentally, it's a kind of almost like memorization, Anki, at very least the Anki is, is the technique and the, the process, you know, on, on the working process on how to do this, okay? So they're testing your ability to have mastered an existing set of problems and um, preferred procedures for solving those problems and very often for the uh, well-established um, answers as well too. Um, and so, you know, there is this whole publishing genre in Japan, you know, that uh, which focuses on Tordai Sei and, uh, you know, what percentage of, and, and it's always ripped off and used on, on Mimbo television programs that are quite good, I don't know, as well, you know, that, that tend to focus on, you know, Tordai Sei no Nanmari ga Kono Monday o Kai Ketsu de and then they throw it to you, okay? Um, so I think you're all uh, familiar with this. Um, yeah, they did their homework. <laughs> um, they uh, they have a certain established skill set for um, dealing with well-defined problems. But where the world gets really interesting and where we need more and more to focus on are actually when the problems are not well-defined, uh, when they're ill-defined problems with both the, uh, the end goals are not clear, the means are not known, okay, and so the design process itself is really about the problem discovery, the problem definition, and then redefining the problem. You know, very often when, if you're chatting with a friend, um, you'll be going through your mind as they're speaking, you're like, oh, I know, I, yeah, I, I know what this person's problem is. And then you go, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, now I see the problem here. The problem is, and Okay, then they kind of react by help by saying, no, 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 I'm, 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 I've already thought of that. Okay, so they come back with a different definition of the problem, and then you may challenge that again. So, really, so much problem solving is actually a meta conversation about what is the problem in the first place. And this is critical in, in, in negotiation circumstances. It's, diff, it's critical to counseling, to working with people, because very often people will bring a list of issues um, that are relatively easy to talk about, either because it's acceptable to talk about those kind of issues or because they have an existing narrative or an existing story about them. Um, or because someone else has already told them this is your problem. So being a very good listener and observer and very gently probing very often people's story, you'll discover that the issues are actually more kind of underlying issues, you know, um, that uh, you think about this in your personal relationships. Um, you know, you might be having a fight with your, your beloved about, you know, someone coming late or how they squeeze the, squeeze the toothpaste, you know, tube or any, any manner of issues, right? Okay. Um, very often the details don't really matter. It really boils down to something more fundamental. I just fundamentally doubt whether this person actually really cares about me, <laughs> okay? Whether they're really thinking about me, um, or whether they're being faithful or whatever, okay? Um, and maybe even more fundamental one, whether you actually like this person yourself, you know, whether everyone's got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, so I should have one too, but you're actually putting up with someone who doesn't actually, in the words of Kondo Mani, um, who we'll come back to next week, um, feeling not feeling the talky mickey, okay? 
Uh, we'll talk about the KonMati method uh, next week. So this becomes quite kind of sobering to figure out what the underlying um, problem is when very often the superficial expression of the problem is only that, it is over superficial. I think it was George Bernard Shaw who remarked on the, the habits of someone else eating, you know, that, and your partner um, said, if you're, if you're not in love with someone, um, the way they hold the fork or the tiniest difference in the way they choose their food can drive you to insanity. Whereas if you really love the person, they could upend their entire dinner plate in your lap and you wouldn't really care. So, you know, we need to interrogate ourselves, first of all, and we need to very gently engage with others to try and understand what the underlying kind of um, issues are. So I, th I think intuitively we get that when we think about it. Um, and it's not much of a step from our normal understandings of problem solving to this. Then there's this whole new category of, of the uh, more, uh, more difficult category of problems that have been referred to in the last couple of decades as wicked problems, okay? And uh, there's a link to a reading by Buchanan on the course website if you'd like to follow up on this. Um, these are problems that are not clearly specified um, attempts to specify the, uh, the problem lead to so many more questions and it's a continual reformation, uh, reformulation, sorry. You know, it's um, almost like trying to push on air. You know, the more you get at the problem, the more you keep revealing the sheer complexity of it, okay? And the critical thing here is that um, very famously in the words of Roe, there is no stopping rule. Um, now, a lot of people just stop trying at all. More kitty gun, I cut my, yeah, you know, hands up, you know, kind of give up. OK, but in many circumstances, you cannot do this, you know, the, that it's that uh, continuous working away at a problem. And very often it's a problem of understanding. This is what drives scientists. You know, this is what drives theoretical physicists to 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 places where I just can't go mentally. I mean, I'm in awe of so many theoretical, theoretical physicists, both in terms of the uh, um, their tools at hand, the sophistication of their mathematics, for example, but also where they go in terms of imagining, you know, what we take to be reality in ways that um, slip far away from our, from, from our grounded sense of what reality is, of course. Um, but conceptually is, is absolutely vital to expanding around how the universe works, okay? Um, so a really important implication um, of this, but we're also going to see that this is this is fundamentally how design differs as a way of engaging with the world and seeing the world, is that there's not one answer, correct answer waiting to be discovered. So there are differing and equally valid formulations of the problem, but with different um, solution implications. So this is, this is a critical distinction for designers. Designers are comfortable with the idea that they're choosing one popular one possible take on a problem and choosing to limit the definition of the problem somewhat artificially to make it tractable you know unless you draw boundaries around the problem um, it can be a wicked problem it can you, you can slide and slip forever okay so you need to establish some boundaries and then you also bring a somewhat arbitrary kind of uh, proposals or interventions to solve that problem and other people would define it a bit differently and other people would bring different approaches and they are equally valid um, as a first move. So you've got to try it, you've got to see where it, where it gets you to with a very strong understanding of the needs of the client. And remember, this is the critical thing with design. You're working on other people's problems and hopefully they're gonna pay you for it um, or at least um, the goodwill that comes from, from helping people out in need. So I want to speak briefly to design thinking as a liberal art um, an ethos and a method. And I've actually written a, um, uh, an article specifically on this with a co-author and friend. Um, um, it's just a younger guy, just finished off a PhD, finishing off a PhD at Torday, um, but he's currently in um, Denmark with his um, Japanese wife and gorgeous young son. It's just turned one last Sunday. Okay. Um, Richard Buchanan, very famous article, Wicked Problems in Design Thinking. Um, in, in the journal Design Issues in 1992, Richard, this Richard Buchanan article is widely cited. Um, so he um, posits that we can actually think of design thinking as in a sense, the new liberal art, which is multiply, multi, multiple, multidisciplinary, sorry, has multiple perspectives. 
content. I know. So, so he says, we have seen design grow from a trade activity to a segmented profession, to a field for technical research and to what should now be recognized as a new liberal art of technological culture. Okay. Um, that we bring uh, diverse means, technological and other means to solving problems um, in a happily um, unforced multidisciplinary kind of way. Uh, so this is particularly exciting for the liberal arts because of what it, what it says is, uh, as he develops the work, that actually the process of having diverse experiences, learning experiences and travel and all of those kind of cultural experiences and whatnot, um, increases the intellectual resources, the problem solving um, capability of you um, to deal with very specific um, problems that might emerge that you'll go through a process of kind of defining, okay? And just simply having a multicultural background um, can be very helpful that people approach um, seemingly similar issues with different assumptions and therefore different implications. And actually to be comfortable with that ambiguity becomes a critical aspect of a designerly way of thinking. And this is particularly good for the liberal arts because it says, okay, well, what we do, you know, we're with, it's just been this article of faith, that's made much evidence, but there's an article of faith that you do liberal arts and therefore you're equipped for a rapidly changing world, but we don't quite know what the future is going to bring. Um, but then you add design to that and you have the one thing that the liberal arts is often criticized for lacking, and that is a ready to use methodology. And this is, this is why I'm really emphasizing design thinking in this course. And also, by the way, why I'm advocating um, that we hire someone specifically to teach design in SILS. Um, because I think if you take liberal arts and then you take design as an applied um, endeavor and put the two together, it is very, very powerful. And it helps to respond to that criticism that um, liberal arts is a little bit like a uh, no, kind of salad bar, you know, the, or a, fami, choto fami des mitana, a little bit of everything, but not particular, okay? Um, by the way, when you're doing shukatsu, if anyone criticizes you for that, to say, mate, here, simon ga nai no, major ga nai no, uh, no, the response is very simple. Most Japanese universities don't have a real major, okay? You go to seke, you can get out of seke without doing serious economics, okay? Um, that's not the case in the UK or Australia, or I'm, you know, where I'm from, highly specialized programs. It's not the case in US liberal arts colleges. We actually have very, they have very clear kind of major structures. Um, but even in, in ostensibly quite specialized uh, faculties, um, there's actually not that much of the specialization uh, per se. And in fact, um, mirroring actually what was GHQ kind of influence, the, uh, the first two years were considered to be kind of kyo gakko, and then the next two, the final two years were more the kamoko or oine, um, but then people doing shukatsu and a whole bunch of things and whatnot. So there's not as much simon say as often assumed. But anyway, we've got to work within the constraints of SILs, and I would encourage you to think about how you can develop your own skill set, which give you a story about being able to apply your liberal arts perspective. Design is one way to get at this, course, engaging with digital transformation um, is another way, which is uh, a theme we'll come back to. Um, so a bit in terms of definition. So I talk about the ethos method and methodology, just to draw a distinction. So the straight from Oxford Dictionary, um, ethos, the characteristic spirit of a culture, an era or a community in our concern, designers, as manifested in its attitudes and aspirations. You know, there are designerly ways of thinking and of feeling, and that's what I want to come back to. Then there's a method, a particular procedure for accomplishing or approaching something, especially if it's a really systematic or an established one. So we go further um, and then talk about a methodology. So a system of methods used in a particular area of study or activity. So there's a kind of a method to the madness, you know, as the English expression is with designers. And we go further in companies uh, design firms where they will formalize this sometimes, their design processes and think about a particular methodology. Similarly in consulting firms, you know, there are, there are established rubrics, methodologies, uh, in a sense to simplify, standardize, make more efficient what they do, um, which can be ultimately quite 
problematic actually in the uh, the regular consulting firms. And that's one reason why um, many of them are actually looking to bring something like design thinking in as well. Because inherently in consulting, one of the fundamental problems is once upon a time, um, the consultants were very often say graduates with MBAs and they would be going into companies and talking to senior executives who you know, worked all their years in the industry, but hadn't had um, formal business training or hadn't been taught analytical skills, data analysis and those kind of things. Um, they kind of picked it up along the way somewhat. Uh, these days, the problem in business consulting is that the consultants go in and they talk to the clients and they find out the clients are their Dai Senpai at Harvard or MIT or whatever, or Stanford or any other business school. And um, so the clients have heard it all before. Um, in fact, when I ran the uh, once off corporate case study with Hitachi, um, I made a bit of an idiot of myself at uh, going to head office of Hitachi and emphasize it'd be really good to do this because you know it's such a trend in business schools to do case study based learning and they were so gentle on me I mean, the uh, really top executives two of them said yeah yeah we're both of us we we did a lot of case study methodology when we we're doing mbas at harvard and uh, he did two at stanford so I realized i had two harvard mbas and a stanford mba all paid for by hitachi by the way <laughs> um, i don't know if they still do that um i said mm, okay and here i am saying from wasada sills okay let's do corporate case studies um, so yeah, uh, that's uh, a kind of a microcosm um, of what you get in the consulting industry now that the clients, um, the CEOs and other top executives are better educated than the people in the consulting firms um, themselves. So the consulting firms are looking to do something different. Now, the first thing we need to do is, of course, to recognize when we talk about design and designers that they, they have their own distinctive vocabulary like anything does. Um, one career tip for you is whatever field you end up in and whenever you're dealing with any organization, make an effort to as quickly as possible master the vocabulary of the industry to be able to talk in, in um, the terms that people do. Similarly, to engage with any administrative process that you're subjected to engage with the logic of it. You will never win an argument by bringing completely different logic, okay? Um, you have to always argue in terms of the established vocabulary and logics of the culture, the industry, the organization that you are subject to at the time. But here are a few terms anyway that um, designers use. They often talk about emergent properties. And this notion of emergence is a very significant thing that the problem and the solution are revealed simultaneously through the design process. Um, you'll also hear this notion of emergent a lot these days in discussions of uncertainty. Our thinking in economics um, parallels um, theoretical understandings in physics, and don't ask me for that because I'm not well educated in that at all, um, but certainly more on the economic side. Um, there has been a huge shift towards recognizing um, ubiquitous uncertainty that systems are not stable, that they are evolving, that they have what we call emergent properties. Okay. Um, this once upon a time, and it's been a hard habit for human beings to break, uh, it was considered that the world was a very stable place, that there were fixed laws that the world followed. And you can see in the early days, you know, when people started to think about you know, Newtonian, Newtonian physics and whatnot. Okay, where well, we understand the underlying um, rules by which the world works, um, then all we need to do is just do the uh, kind of the chaucer, the adjustments, okay, uh, to make the world a better place, okay, following um, within the constraints of the, you know, the established rules. And economics has very much moved on from that. Um, design is very comfortable with uncertainty. This is one of the, uh, the great attractions of design thinking, to focus on um, the emergent notion of even the problem itself you're working on, okay? That as you start to fiddle and you realize that th things go in certain directions, but not in ways that you expect. And then uh, and economists are big on this as well, the notion of unintended consequences. And then you try and understand why it caused this kind of unintended consequence and then a corrective to that, okay? So it's obviously a case of two steps forward, one step back, or even one step forward and two steps back, okay? Or even more sometimes. 
Um, we see that um, because they're not seeking some absolute truth, they're not seeking the correct answer, they're making a proposition. This is a key term, a proposal or a solution. And so we talk in terms of a proposition as being more or less persuasive, okay? So within what we know about the problem and the means available to us, is this a rather persuasive design proposition or not? And then if we're getting somewhere, if we, it looks like we're getting close to actually resolving many of the issues for the client, the problem we're working on, um, we can speak of resolution, where the proposed solution to an identified problem is brought to a highly resolved state, okay? Um, Wonderful article, Designly Ways of Thinking by Nigel Cross. Um, the background on this, um, in very simply, is uh, in the 1970s and early 1980s in Britain, design, which typically existed in more technical schools or specialist institutions, was being brought into the universities more generally. Um, a lot of countries there were, and it's been an ongoing process, higher education rationalization. Um, so design often was kind of done over in more the craft school, the technical school, or, you know, um, very often in a more applied kind of way. And uh, as higher education systems expanded, there tended to be a lot of turning of technical schools, technical education um, into formal university level education and often literally force, it, force mergers of, of institutions. So in the Australian case, for example, all of the colleges of advanced education, the technical colleges in a German sense, the uh, Fachhochschule, um, which have been kind of elevated as well to quasi-university status. Um, these in the Australian case and the British case were literally turned into universities. And this prompted some really big discussions about, well, what kind of assumptions people make? Because universities are very snobby places, you know, the, the life of the mind. Um, and indeed, we've got this whole mind, mind and body split by the way, the whole, the whole trend, by the way, in terms of, of psychology and psychiatry is to, is to say that there is, an, uh, there is no simple distinction between mind and body, but um, that's kind of ironic, but anyway. Um, so in this highly intellectual environment, um, how was designed to respond? One way was to kind of throw off its um, craft orientation, applied orientation, and to say is, well, designers do design, and this is an intellectual process. Uh, and so this was one of the compromises that was made in universities. And there's been an argument that that actually has been problematic for design because people move too far away from the more kind of hands-on material-based approach to design. Now, a couple of things here. Interestingly, in the Japanese case, um, there is still a hands-on component. If you go to architecture school, actually, you spend so much time modeling and still Japanese architects, um, architecture practice, uh, uh, famous or infamous for making endless models on things. So um, you've got to be a little bit crafty in that sense. On the other hand, they've been incredibly slow um, in introducing um, digital education. So teaching AutoCAD, the, the fundamental software, you kind of do one or two courses and most people who can do it well, have pretty, pretty much kind of taught themselves. Some have even double schooled. They've actually gone off to a, to a separate um, Semongaku or something to learn how to, to kind of do this, okay? But by bringing design into the universities, it meant that there had to be the conversation about, well, do these people think and act in the same kind of way as what we understand um, with academics elsewhere, okay? Um, particularly in relation to the humanities and the sciences. Are they humanities? Are they sciences? Well, there are, you know, the architects have a bit of both. They've got a foot in both camps, you know, architecture sometimes referred to as creating frozen poetry. Um, but, you know, you want architects to understand material properties. You don't want them to make something beautiful that then collapses and kills everybody. Okay, so those students who came out of, you know, an art program coming to architecture struggle with the materials course, for example. Um, the kind of stuff you'd find, you know, people tend to assume in an engineering program and in the reverse, those, those are very solidly Vicke are suddenly expected to be um, deep humanists, sociologists, and of course, uh, to pursue beauty as well. So in the British case, when they were thinking about the status of design as higher education, um, this article was written by Nigel Cross 
um, to try and, and he explicitly articulated this notion that actually there are very just, just distinctive field of knowledge, designerly ways of knowing, um, which it should be recognized and valued and embraced, but it is a bit different from the humanities and the sciences, okay? So it's not just a second run humanities or a half-assed kind of, kind of science. Um, and he explicitly articulated a bunch of desirable values, core design values. So empathy for the, for the client, practicality, okay? And universities have always been in two minds about practicality. Remember actually, by the way, this, this oops, Oops, where have I gone? This dealing with the practical world has been a gradual struggle for universities. Remember one of the founding disciplines in um, great medieval universities was actually medicine, which has almost always been applied. So the notion that um, universities have always just been abstract ivory tower and not applied is actually not true. It's a subset of the faculties of the universities were like that. As the, uh, the focus on science grew ever larger, of course, there's a very strong orientation towards experimentation and figuring out how the world really works and all the rest of it. Um, but we can, we can see this is practicality and how it, it does differ in a way from the sciences, and we'll come back to it in a moment, but appropriateness as well, degree of fit for the particular needs for the client and its circumstances. And ingenuity or kind of cleverness, okay, clever solutions. Humanities tend to be more focused on justice, commitment, imagination, and subjectivity, your own very particular experience of something. The sciences concerned about, you know, objective truth, the truths of the world, okay? Um, so objectivity, rationality, and neutrality. So the difference between the sciences and the designers is that, of course, they, they're going to completely accept the physical material constraints of the world, um, but because they're solving a very particular program that often has deep kind of say cultural you know, meaning, for example, to people, um, there, there is a degree of arbitrariness to it. The life of the mind, there is a strong imagined dimension. We think about simply designing a church or a community space or any of these, anything, any of these things you might be doing. Um, there is significant roles for symbolism, for very distinctive um, and diverse modes of living. So the, it cannot be reduced to some simple um, universal truth about, you know, around the material properties of the world. Um, and this also leads into very different ways of kind of communicating. You know, designers like to put a proposition out there and to have a conversation about it. And in design education, one of the critical practices is the crit or the critique. Um, and this is one of the things that I found hugely interesting, having been involved um, with architectural education somewhat in recent years. Thanks very much to Ariz Golani, who teaches architecture here. And uh, I was on sabbatical in Israel for a while and spent time actually with you know, being involved in an architectural program with architectural students. Um, and my brother was an architecture student while I was an undergraduate and uh, whatnot. So the design school, you bring along your proposition and you stick it on the wall and everyone stands around you and everyone leans in and has a look and the, the professor makes some comments and students are expected to interact. Um, and it's quite an intimidating kind of process, um, but a very rewarding process in a lot of ways. Some of you may have heard of Pucha, Pecha Kucha. Um, this is actually created by um, several architects here in uh, Tokyo. Um, and um, Klein Dytham, the Astrid and uh, Mark, um, they created this format for architects to pre uh, present their ideas. So 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide, fixed, bang, because they say the architects will talk all day. Um, and this has become absolutely global. And it's actually from onomatopoeia from Japanese, Pecha Kucha. Uh, that's where it comes from and Google it and you can, you can see this. So, and so you have these Pecha Kucha nights and whatnot. And when, when you go along there, you realize there are so many people who are in broad design communities, whether they're graphic designers, architects, product designers, um, urban designers and whatnot, they're very comfortable with this kind of format. Um, and so they have to be very good con um, communicators because you have to articulate your particular vision, your proposition to a client. Um, but you also have to be humble because you have to be able to, uh, to update and, and interact um, in response to the client. So it's deeply iterative. So very briefly on the theory, okay. Um, 
early theoretical ex explorations of design theaters in really entailing problem solving through a fresh association of established elements, okay? Um, somewhere within the creative mind. And he didn't try and second guess that. Um, this was very much what we call a behavioral tradition. The scientists, the social scientists really concerned about things you can only see and objectively measure, okay? Um, later on in trying to understand how people uh, working in a design process, uh, they've been focused on say cognition, as I say here, structures and mechanisms of cognition, information processing and decision-making and problem solving. So there's some quite sophisticated analysis of how designers are kind of working or trying, trying to analyze it um, in terms of um, knowledge processing, information processing, uh, for example. Um, one of the reasons for this is for very, very large scale complex design projects. In, in some sense, if you can understand the way how individual designers think and to break this down and to formalize it institutionally to embed it. Okay, so you can have whole teams of people um, working on something and then creating platforms that kind of enable these kind of design processes. By the way, some of the, uh, the most successful um, IT firms these days are the ones that actually provide the platforms through which people can collaborate um, to work out uh, effectively um, programming and, and uh, effectively you know, digital design solutions. Okay, so we, we can think of scientific problem solving as very analysis oriented. Okay, so you're finding the hidden or the underlying rules that govern a particular dynamic you know, through a breaking down into distinct elements. And this was the original attempt to try and achieve this and understand the design too. And it kind of defined that in a way, defined that in a way, because, you know, when people had studied um, how scientists work, then went and studied how designers work, is they realized that designers are much more kind of synthesis oriented. Okay, so you've got lots of identified elements pulling together a kind of coherent whole, um, and then they keep repeating that kind of process. So they're always looking for fresh connections and fresh sources of, um, influence fresh perspectives on things, okay? So it's a very syncretic kind of way of working. And that's, you can see why it privileges um, a liberal arts kind of background, for example. In reality, there's both analytical and synthesizing components and often it's sequential, you roll between one or another. Um, so you pull different ideas together and then you maybe test them by, by going to look at supportive data, for example. So anyway, some, let's draw some fundamental conclusions about what design is. It's purposive, it has a goal, it's intentionate, it's deliberate, it's future oriented, it's kind of optimistic, it's solution focused, you wanna make a better future situation, okay? Um, it often doesn't start with a well-specified problem, okay? It's discovering the problems, we've talked about it, okay? So it's not a typical linear process, it is iterative, it's backwards and forwards, solution seeking, prototyping, testing with users, testing with the target audience, okay? It's not one shot. You can immediately see why this is a threat to large companies, but why companies need it too, because the last thing large companies want to do that are hierarchical is to be iterative. Decision comes from on high, the middle managers then bring it down as an order, a kind of a chocolate in a sense. The last thing they want to do is up and down, up and down, up and down, iterative. That's by the way, also why American companies have become so much flatter in their structures. Um, when you've got a chain of hierarchy, the information doesn't flow up very well, okay? Um, so when it's flatter, it's easier to have those exploratory conversations to actually prototype ideas, to test solutions, and you get negative pushback, um, and then you go back and you rethink it, okay? Um, so task specification, this is, um, you don't want to over-specify the task too early uh, because it just crushes creativity, okay? Um, you really need to understand how the client understands their own problem. That becomes your task. You have to respectively interrogate the client is a critical thing. You then, oops, sorry. You need a very clear sense then of the target audience, the goal. Um, this is from a communications perspective. So I'm adding this to communications. So the target audience and the intended effect on them via a communicative act. So I'm bringing this now to the communication function, which is ultimately our concern. So of course the message must resonate with the audience as we've already seen, and it must lead to an action or a proclivity that serves the communicator's objectives. Now, um, a common thing in discussing uh, design and the sciences in general is the notion of divergent and convergent thinking. This is very big in discussing creativity, okay? 
Divergent thinking encourages an expression of divergent, unorthodox, fresh perspectives. So you go really wide, okay? Lots of ideas, lots of fresh perspectives. Um, often, you know, whether it's a, a rough kind of mind mapping exercise or you know, ideating or brainstorming exercises, for example. Um, you have to guard against judgment. For this to work well, you have to, you have to let your creative juices flow. When people are doing this as a team, you can't jump in and make negative comments. If anyone does an eye roll, aha, they're out. Chuck them out of the room if necessary, okay? You must not reject new ideas too soon. You also have to be very expecting, uh, accepting, sorry, and expecting and, and, and accepting of unclear expression. You know, it's like, mm, I'm kind of feeling, uh. you know, often people are impatient. They want to hear something well expressed. If it's well expressed, it's not original. That's the critical thing. If it's really distilled down into a few key words, it's normally not original. You know, the vague intuition that you can't really find the words for, normally that's where the fresh perspective lurks, okay? So you can see very clearly that people with strong opinions, um, quick to opinion, quick to judgment, and impatient are the enemy of creative thinking, okay? At the same time, you've got all these ideas coming out and you need an effective way to capture them, okay? And then the sorting and the condensing, the insights, the waiting, um, the stickets, you know, the 3M great invention, okay? These things, okay? Um, this is the standard thing that people just, they write them up and they stick them all on the wall and then, then you can um, cluster them and whatnot. It's a very common way to go. Um, there are digital versions of this as well. Then the convergent thinking is the synthesizing, the solution-oriented process to the results of the brainstorming. So it's highly iterative. It's what we call it's episodic, okay? Um, and in the discussion of design approaches, this is well understood. Um, particularly I mentioned this guy, uh, um, uh, Roe, he, a professor at Harvard, who wrote a very influential book on the way that architects think. And he studied a lot of architects at work to, to come to this. So the critical thing is that designers move back and forth between different types of um, knowledge and working, okay, is a critical thing. So there's a lot of backtracking, sometimes seemingly little progress, and then moments of quick resolution. So it's often darkest just before the dawn. You're like, oh, we're going nowhere. And it's often is dawn. It's a typical all-nighter kind of way of working. And then something kind of clicks. And then it has these wonderful expanding properties that you kind of take off. And then everything kind of falls into place once you get it, OK? So then there's the full working out of the details um, is the critical thing. So. But each designer works in a bit different way. Um, some of them have their own particular organizing kind of principles. And that's why there's a very distinctive signature. You know, we see, we see certain designers work in a certain way. They bring certain established, you know, preferences. If we look at architects, for example, we can see that Sanam, one of the most influential Japanese architectural firms abroad, you know, their, their buildings are generally white, they're organic, they flow, follow the shape of the landscape, they tend to be enveloped in glass, they have an established vocabulary and also a mode of working. You know, they're very Japanese in the sense that they, they use a lot of models, for example, uh, to work. And I know of one instance where they were the only one who turned up in the pitch with a model of the site and that got them the job because most people can't read um, plans and elevations in architecture. You go to the clients, here's a model. <laughs> okay, here's your site. That's what we plan to put on top of it. That speaks to people. They get that. People get three-dimensionality. Okay. So uh, designers bring certain principles, but then they've got a project-specific idea. So this this helps to give them the, they've got this the signature, but that each project is is tailor-made. They don't just bring a, a, a you know, off-the-shelf solution and plonk it there. Okay. Critically, absolutely critical, design is normative, okay? It's passing judgment, okay? Um, because you've got so many different potential options and you've got to choose. Really important thing is um, constraints compel design innovation, okay? The tougher the constraints, the more you have to work at. So all of those things, budget, deadline, what the client wants, the program, client values, all of these things. It improves the design and it improves the designers. Now, briefly on IDEO and Stanford, I'm looking at the time. I don't remember, I'm going to, I always knew that I would never get through all this today. Uh, that's why next week is, is 
bit minimalist in terms of talking about resolution. Um, but IDEO and Stanford, um, critical thing here is um, the Harvard Business Review summary of what they propose. Um, creativity is something you practice, not just a talent you're born with, okay? Uh, and they emphasize, these are the Kelly brothers writing here in Harvard Business Review, our job isn't to teach them creativity, it's to help them rediscover their creative confidence, the natural ability to come up with new ideas and the courage to try them out, okay? Um, and their premise is that if you look at little kids play, they're incredibly creative. Kids are just constantly, you know, creating imagining worlds, picking up a stick and turning it into whatever, you know, imaginally be whatever and, and coming up with so many interesting kind of solutions. And to, to recapture that spirit of playful, creative endeavor. And they've got many instances in their books about, you know, talking to, to people, often CEOs of large companies to say, no, I'm not the creative type and all of those things which kind of impacted on them. And one reason why they, they advocate this is because um, most social goals are being directed, are being worked on by NGOs and activists and whatnot. And there is this very strong recognition that they can't afford designers. So if you can actually turn the, turn the people who want to make a difference, you know, whether it's the teacher, the nurse, or the, the, the aid worker or whatever, to give them some design tools um, to be more effective in the change they want to have. The ideating process, I've just got some examples here. These, this is, um, and we'll come back to this when Adam Johns joins us from Sophia. Um, this is where I just simply got students to ideate in terms of give us individual words about images of Japan, Japan's brand abroad, okay? Positive, negative, um, and whatnot. And each year they've done this and you can look through the slides yourself, okay? Always snap this. Really interesting things here is that the rules that apply have an impact. If you limit the number of words that people can say, I found negative words disappeared. When you put people in groups and said, come up with five to seven words, you got lots of negative things too, which were really important. Um, there are a whole bunch of kind of um, negative things which are part of the image of Japan, that when you only gave people a few choices, strikingly what they did was that they tended to limit to the positive, okay? Um, then there's this process of drawing them together and clustering them and trying to reduce them to, to um, key summary elements. You know, one thing we did, for example, is, you know, you, you take all these different attributes. Um, and one of the things that come through is this, this way of capturing was actually one thing, one, one word to describe images of Japan was so Japan is very quirky. It even sounds cute in Japanese, quirky, um, which is a nice way of capturing, you know, the whole otaku effect and a whole bunch of things that are there. Now, in terms of the ideating process, um, the doubter, the cynic and whatnot um, can be kind of constructive, uh, deconstructive, okay? You need the devil's advocate to be able to put out an alternative, but if it's someone who is also naturally a kind of a cynical person, it can be um, destructive. I don't wanna linger on prototyping because that's not so important for us um, in terms of making things. Um, but the implication here is in communication design, you really need to test your message with an audience first. Okay, that's why you need editors as well. When you're writing a text, you need another set of eyes because you know your intention might be um, misunderstood or simply people may get sick of the things you say. Um, between you and me, I'm getting sick of her hearing about how much Wasada has spent on um, air conditioning. Okay, right. Is that the only rationale why you guys have to come on campus sometime? Okay, because we spent like nearly half your brain on air conditioning or something. Okay, okay. So you need to test uh, your ideas. Okay. Now, um, this is where I was hoping to get to today, because uh, this is a natural kind of stopping point. We're going to talk about doing creative and advertising. And I'm going to, from the start of next class, talk about some of the most influential approaches. Um, and uh, that's what I touched on there with David uh, Ogilvie and whatnot. So engage with the design thinking, uh, all those the materials uh, that are there, okay? And um, we'll kick off next week with the, uh, the discussion of how 
um, the ideating process uh, has worked in some textbook instances, quite literally, um, for advertising and, and to draw some links with um, design thinking, what's similar and uh, what's um, different, then that will lead into a discussion of what I refer to as um, redescription there. And redescription is really an extension of this ideating process. And it's really um, thinking about uh, familiar objects in new ways in a more open-minded kind of way as to how people draw value um, from them, okay? Um, and when we uh, start to do that, um, it leads to new potential in terms of thinking about new products or new ways to sell an existing product. I mean, one thing, for example, cigarettes, um, which I despise, I'm quite open about. Um, if you ask the right questions, you discover that one reason why a lot of people smoke is because they're actually shy. Okay, and they're a little bit nervous, and um, it gives them something to do with their hands um, as a point of distraction. It's a social prop. Um, it's also sometimes a kikake, literally to engage with people, or very often it's an excuse um, to avoid awkward social situations. So popping outside for a smoke when the conversation gets a little bit awkward, for example, that's ironically why a not insignificant minority of people continue to smoke precisely when they can't smoke inside um, because actually they want an excuse to pop outside to get away because kind of painful conversations and all the rest of it um, we'll see susan sontag um, who wrote very influentially about photography there's a wonderful thing in her book she wrote um later on we talk about visuality she said that actually uh the camera the rise of the camera and taking a picture has saved enormous numbers of people from awkward social shushing, social situations. I said from shushing there. And uh, it's like when when the conversation's not going well, it's like shushing toro ne, doing a pose. Okay, you know how many how many kind of like a bit painful family kind of meetings with the relatives and whatnot when you run out of things to say, uh, you decide to take the picture instead. Okay. Um, also, she made the observation that by taking a picture, actually. It's not because you're really enjoying yourself with the relatives or whatever. It's just kind of proof that you tried. You know, I did meet with them. We did, we did do our best. We did pretend that we cared. We've got them. Uh, okay, don't accuse me of not having done the right thing by the family. So we need to interrogate the value that is coming from any act. Okay, and unless we understand that, we can't get really creative in how we're going to um, pitch our product as bringing value. Um, to a potential consumer, similarly to, to change people's behavior, okay? Um, in interesting kind of ways. If you wanna nudge people to different kinds of behavior, understand their motivations, you know, for behaving a certain way in the first place. Um, and of course, the worst thing you can do, by the way, is just tell people to behave themselves. <laughs> yeah, um, normally the, uh, there's a great m, m line to this effect. It's like, you know, you're, you're, I'm in trouble with the government, I'm loving it. Uh, Cause up until now, no one's given me any attention. And the reason why I've been behaving badly is I wanted some attention. You tell me I'm in trouble, great. I'm finally getting the attention I want. I'm gonna keep up being bad, okay? So we need to understand those underlying motivations for what people do, what they buy. And until we do that, um, we can't um, find the underlying sources of value and speak to people in meaningful kind of ways. Okay. Um, I'll leave it there. Now you've got your video projects. So as promised, I'll hang around here and uh, take some Q and A and please don't hesitate. If you've got a very specific question, ask it. What's a question for you is probably a question for others as well. Okay. Um, and we'll do that for a while. And then I will up and head down to the classroom later on for 3.30 anyone who wants to speak to me face to face. I'm not going to do any presentation or anything. I'm just simply I'm just coming down there with my mask on. I'm not even going to turn the AV system on or whatever. Okay. But I'll be at the front. Use my big voice. Okay. Um, sufficient social distancing, but you can interact with me face to face if you prefer to do that. Okay. Um, and if there's anyone who has um, anything very particular that they want to discuss with other people here um, and they're not in the classroom, then you can send me a message and I promise I'll be um, more attentive than I have been in, off and on the last couple of days um, in uh, replying to people. I've already set up a couple of one-on-one um, -on -one, um, Zoom, so it's getting a bit, bit full on Thursday, but if necessary, if there's any really pressing issue, I can do that as well too. So thanks guys and um, over to you. So far away with any questions you might have. <laughs>